Hello, we're Tom and Chris, we're those film guys. And welcome to the second part of our Lord of the Rings and Unexpected Marathon. Today we'll be looking at the second in the trilogy, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. The Two Towers. Um, and where should we start with this? Because I think you could almost argue this one being... Because, I mean, people have the argument that The Lord of the Rings, is, especially when I talk to people... The Lord of the Rings has is just a film about people walking from one location to you know that joking clerks where they just walk walk up to Mount Doom and they go and then just walk off. Uh, this this probably has the most amount of walking in it, but I wouldn't say it's dull walking. <laughs> no, it is. It, it seems to be more focused on one area. Yeah. And this obviously dealing with the area of Rohan, whereas the first one was much more broader and took a longer, longer geographical yeah. place. Um, I do think that this one has probably one of the most biggest parts of character development in it because now all the fellowship have been broken up. They have relationships with slightly less of an ensemble cast. Yeah. Um, to be to be quite I'll get I'll to be quite honest I'll get my one problem with it out of the way, um, and that's that I think the hobbits aren't featured as much as they perhaps should mm. be, um, but I don't think that really hurts it in a major way. I just think it's a little problem I I have with the particular film. Yeah, the um, main players certainly are Legolas, Aragorn and Gimli, I'd say. It yeah. tends to follow their journey more. And the whole Rohan thing is played up bigger than the actual Everything quest else, to yeah. do to destroy the ring. And uh, you get new char new characters, like... Um, I've forgotten his name. King Theoden? Yeah, what's his name? He was a ch children's TV actor before, and I can't remember, for the life of me, can't remember his name. Like, it, it is completely blank. But they introduce new characters... Uh, Théoden, uh, King of Rohan, uh, you have Gollum, yeah. is now an integral part. He was in the first one, part. but you only got fleeting yeah. glimpses of him, but he is a proper major character from this point onwards. And to be honest, he's probably the most tragic as well in the second film. Yeah. Um, we get more on his backstory at the beginning of Return of the King, but yeah. we... Um, and this film really was the first time we'd seen this kind of technology in a film before. Yeah. The use of motion capture, taking an actor, putting all cameras all over them, well, and then translating it to... I mean, you <laughs> you had it in for Jar Jar Binks. Well, yeah. Sort of. But, well, you can't... Well, We're comparing the Star Wars prequel trilogy to this great cinematic... <laughs> Yeah, I know. Experience. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, you have motion motion capture yeah. for, and you know, to put it out there, I, I'm I have to agree with them um, with the marketing for this um, because they mark like they put up the challenge of having Andy Circus get an Oscar for his motion capture performance, and to be quite honest, it's, it, it it is his character. He defines that character. Yeah, he he does the movements. The he is that he is that character, and even now, when um, his work on Rise of the Planet of the Apes, um, motion capture tends to get overlooked quite a lot. Yeah, and there is a lot that goes into it. And Andy Serkis, I think, is a very underrated actor because he does do a lot of research and puts everything into the character. Yeah, like I mean, he was in Peter Jackson's King Kong. Yeah, playing Kong. Um, and you know, he does give everything, and really. All the motion capture is there for is to put uh, that Gollum character or that persona or that visual essence of Gollum onto the screen. The performance is his, uh, and the motion capture just sort of enhances his performance, I think. I know some people <coughs> say that um, the use of a fully CGI character interacting with the live action, live action performance doesn't really work, but I think the effects are that good that you kind of see him as there. Yeah. I mean, it was a real performance, so you can't say that it's just added in later and yeah, the people... Because very often in films now, actors will react to nothing, yeah, or like a will, golf ball on yeah. a green they stand. Are, they are acting to something. Yeah. Because Andy Serkis was the, physically on location. Um, because I think it, it really needs... They really needed that... Um, they really needed that sort of 
uh, something to act to. Like we we brushed on it in uh, in the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, <clears throat> but to move on, uh, let me just. What's your favourite thing about uh, Return? I was about to say Return of the King. It's Two Towers. Yeah. Um, the favourite thing about Two Towers is without doubt the final battle scene at Helm's Deep. That to me is one of, yeah. if not one of the best on screen battle sequences ever made for cinema. Yeah. And I remember that worrying me at the time. Close second would be the opening of the film, which shows what happened to Gandalf when he fell down with the Balrog. Because I remember seeing that for the first time, that being the opening scene. And even to this day, it wows me at the scope of that. It grabs you right from the beginning and it throws you straight into this. And it really sets a new tone for it that it's going to be a lot more... I'd, I'd say Two Towers is a lot more action-orientated. Yeah. It does have a lot of um, character development still and a lot of talking scenes, but certainly towards the end, because, I mean, you have the Helm's Deep battle, but then offset you also have the um, the Hobbits, Merry and Pippin, with the Ents on their action scene as well. Yeah. And the stuff with Osciliath as well with Frodo and Sam. So you kind of have this three-way action sequence yeah. at the end. I, I, I gonna, I'm gonna put it out there. This, this is the one I have probably the most problems with. Um, even though I do, it is my favourite. Uh, it is my favourite one of the three. three. But I still have. It is still the one that sort of bugs me because that whole Emin Muil sequence before they meet Gollum I just find really boring and doesn't really go anywhere mm. um, it's probably the one that feels the most scripted as well it's... yeah um, like like I even even today I, I, even now I still have a problem watching it I just can't sort of I think can, can't get to the get to the Gollum mm. bit and it, it just that that to me I had the problem when I was younger watched it for the first time but I still have that problem with it. I still can't get over like how slow moving that whole sequence is, even though it doesn't last very long. And I, I don't really understand why I have that problem, but um, mm. it's still something I can't get over. Um, <clears throat> for me, the problems with this film, I don't really have any problems that destroy the film for me. Um, if I had to pick one, it would probably be the tree beard scenes in it are quite slow. I mean, I know that's mm. the character and that's the whole point of it, that the hobbits want to act to what the enemy is doing but yeah. Treebeard is very slow he has to he has to converse with all the Ents and um, certainly when you've got the high octane action sequences at Helm's Deep and it cuts back to Treebeard you are kind of like ugh yeah. it, it, does, it does slow the pace down yeah. but I mean these are just these are sort of niggles because um, I still love the hell out of it like the whole the, the Helm, Helm's Deep is still my is yeah. my favourite bit in the film um and you know it's just it feels like they up the scale as well from the first film. I mean, the the first film had the had the battle sequence in Moria and the final battle sequence at Amon Hen, but now it just film feels grander. It feels like the story's branching out more. Yeah. It feels like characters are going places you darker places, and it has a much, it does have a much darker tone to it. I I think. Yeah, um, and that's kind of that's kind of what you want with a trilogy like this. Like usually, the second one is the more character-driven, darker one of the three. And I don't think this is as dark as Return of the King, but it's good to have that progression. It's like everything's innocent at the start of Fellowship, and it slowly increases. Yeah. As the three films go on, and that's what I think. I'd not to keep drawing comparisons to the book, but I think that's one of the elements that's really lacking in the books is this sense of urgency to try and destroy the ring. And you really see in these films certainly the slow corruption of Frodo that this yeah. ring is having a big effect on him. Yeah. Oh no, that's uh, that's another. Um, I say the Helm's Deep is my favourite bit, but the um, there's a sequence in it um, which is about probably about a two and a half two, two and a half minute sequence with uh, Liv Tyler's character Arwen um, where Hugo Weaving mm -hmm. talks about how uh, how that even though she loves Aragorn she, she's going to feel I think he uses the word slow decay of time yeah. and it's that whole sequence after like it's just that whole the cinematography in that is great the score is just fantastic and I you know, I manly tears were shed, as it were. 
Yeah, and that's one of the things that Peter Jackson wanted to do was there's a lot more focus on Arwen in this yeah. than the first <clears> film. I mean, she did get screen time in the first one, but this, and Return of the King as well, he did focus on more. Now, you could argue that was to draw the female demographic into the film because, let's be fair, the cast is pretty male-dominated. Yeah. And in the book, Arwen is like mentioned once, maybe twice yeah. throughout, and... I th I like the direction he took with the character. He did spend a lot of time, and I like this dynamic between her her father telling her that she must go into the Undying Lands and not be with Aragorn, and then Aragorn, who is this kind of her, well her love interest, and that lasts throughout the three films. Yeah. Um, and and I I like that dynamic with Eowyn actually, whereas many other films Aragorn would go with Eowyn. But he stays true to Arwen, and yeah. I, I like that. It's not a typical love triangle which most films resort to. Yeah, and um, that that's one of the. Di I think even though you have Gollum as another as a as a tragic character, I think an an underrated tragic character, and that is probably Eowyn as well. I, I keep yeah. trying to get, almost get getting my names mixed up um, because she's very much. Um, She's very much in love with Aragorn, but he's staying true to Arwen. But and and she's got the blessing of basically her her uncle, the King Theoden, um, and she's pretty much the and but but he keeps sort of saying no and sort of but you know it's it's one of those one of those things I I really like the dynamic of it I I quite like um, as well as that um, she's also tragic tragic in that she she wants to help out in the fight she she wants to do something like helms deep yeah and um the warg battle before she says you know i can fight but she keeps getting told no she eventually gets her chance in the next film which will cover more but as well as that um her love interest in aragorn you also have that that she she wants to help in the fight and she's never given that chance yeah um another th another thing we should touch on is is the the um the score a lot yeah. of new Themes are introduced in it, um, and probably if I had to pick out of um, all the different races to be, all the different factions to be, if this were real, you know, this is hypothesis, I'd probably go with uh, either Gondor or Rohan. They have the best themes, the best musical cues in the entire sort of film. Um, and that music just sort of really, the, really sort of gets chills down your spine as well and as well the um the just epic scope of it when the tune when the themes play and the music cues in it's just, it, you know it sends shivers down your spine yeah and um you do get um i want to play praise the cinematography in this as well um when when that rohan theme plays and you get these sweeping shots of the plains of rohan yeah and the mountains and everything it's just great stuff to watch it's everything you want from a film yeah and um, I don't. It builds up on the musical cues of the first film. They're still there, but it also introduces a lot of new ones, which goes through all three films. And I think that's the way that film scores should be. Mm. Most of the times now, if you get a sequel, it's just the rehashed music. But in the Lord of the Rings, each score is different, and yeah. you can listen to it for its own yeah. reasons, which uh, I like. Um, I think as well, what has to be commended is the use of practical effects. I mean Treebeard uh, yeah. for the majority of that was all uh, a construction of um, just a big puppet anim was it? Animatronic. Yeah, animatronic uh, puppet especially when uh, Pip Merry and Pippin are on top of his head and on his branches and things it was it was all animatronics. And you've got to um, give props to Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd because most of their shots were just you know, hooked up to this gigantic animatronic and trying yeah. to react with an inanimate object. Yeah. It, it must have been tough acting-wise, but, you know, they pull it off. They do. Um, and obviously Treebeard gets his CGI shots as well, but yeah. for the most, for the close-up shots. And and the use of miniatures as well, I mean... Uh, Helm's Deep, yeah. Helm's Deep. Uh, you ha also have Isengard as well. and It's just stuff like that that, that you know, you, you can tell it's, it's a miniature and you... It just adds that extra bit of realism to it, to me. It just adds that sort of extra bit of uh, bit of realism and brings it more in, instead of just overly overly overt use of CGI. 
uh, which could ruin ruin a film. It doesn't do that. It just picks its picks its CGI moments. Yeah, I mean, you get the CGI creatures and the yeah. occasional when you want to see the epic scale of like the armies and yeah. everything. Of course, you have to use CGI. Yeah. Like you can't recreate that. Yeah. But it's like in Peter Jackson's film after he did the Lord of the Rings, King Kong, which is just the complete opposite of, I think, what Lord of the Rings did with the balancing of the CGI. It went down it's the just, uh, George yeah. Lucas route at that point. And um, this film just shows it's not needed because this film is very focused on character still. And as long as character and story are at the forefront, you can still have the CGI. Yeah. It's just when the CGI takes over, it, it kind of just derails the entire film completely. Yeah. Um, so you know we've touched on the music uh, we've also touched on the acting I mean all the actors did a, did a, did oh, a great yeah. job in it um, we've touched on the use of minutes cinematography score is there anything else to touch on apart from the plot in the last review we did no towards things oh I want to talk about, if this is going to be a recurring thing, Legolas' badass moment. Oh, yeah. Legolas' second badass moment takes place at the Helm's Deep Battle. He uses an enemy, an enemy shield as a skateboard to skateboard down the stairs whilst firing bow and arrow, jumps off the shield, which then decapitates an Orokai. It is pretty cool to watch. And it doesn't happen in the book, but... No, like, I, like we said in the... Yeah. Um, in our previous review, in our, pre in our Fellowship of the Ring review... <laughs> It needs to be there, it, because it adds comic relief to the seriousness of serious nature of it, and it is actually it is really fun to watch. And I, I think the comic relief certainly, because we've spent more time with these characters, you can kind of gauge their personalities more and how yeah. they bounce off each other in terms of their dialogue. And Legolas and Gimli in this film are hilarious, and certainly the extended cuts. Yeah, they had a lot more of that in. Um, they have this banter where when they're fighting, they're at competition to see who kills more of the enemies, and that, yeah. that's just great to watch as well. Even though that's that's there for sort of good, good comic relief, and it's quite funny, uh, you also get a sense that that's, that's building their friendship as well. Yeah, because that's one of the big things that dwarves and the elf race in Lord of the Rings have never got on. And really, this is one of the only times that elves and dwarves have been paired up together. Yeah. In, in a fellowship, so it's good to see them kind of build this relationship and this kind of... We get this more in Return of the King with this acceptance for one another mm. and respect, which I think is a good aspect to the characters. Now, I've heard that in, in like Legolas's badass moment, as well in this, um, Aragorn is kind of... triggers God mode a lot of the times. So like He's assumed dead and comes back victoriously. He takes on an entire Orokai army single-handedly. And still comes out of it unscathed, but well, you kind of need that, really. Yeah, and and you know it's you can't you do buy it as well. It's not in there because you know the screenwriters need him. Well, I mean they do need him to live, obviously because they got one more film to go. <laughs> they can't have him die, but it's like uh, it's like you just you buy it. It's it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel shoehorned in that he sort of takes on this. It, it feels like something he would do because he um, because he like protecting his friends really yeah. Um, but yeah that's do you think we've covered I've covered what I want to say um, I think I have as well so shall we just final thoughts on Lord of the Rings final, Two Towers final, th final thoughts on Two Towers it is the one I have the most problems with, but I still really enjoy it. And even though I have my problems with it, it is still my favourite one of the three. Yeah, um, for, for a long time this was my favourite one as well, but I think since watching them again I like The Fellowship more because it covers more area, we get to see more of the world. This one seems to be focusing the plot more, especially... Um, around the geographical locations of Rohan, and we get a little bit of Gondor as well. Yeah. Um, oh, that's Actually, that's one thing I want to cover just very briefly. Um, the extended cut, we get um, an extra scene with Boromir mm. in it, with um, his brother Faramir, which we really get in Return of the King, but I think it's good to have it in the Two Towers, which adds set up to that, because we get a whole new level to the character of Boromir. Yeah. 
And um, that allows you, when you go back and watch Fellowship, to really sympathise with the character. And that's what we talked about in our previous review, that he's probably the most tragic one out of the Fellowship. Yeah. Um, but final thoughts on The Two Towers. <laughs> what more can you say? Great film, ramps up the action. It's a lot more action orientated, Lord of the Rings, I'd say, than the first one. And it, it's kind of set up for the final one. It bridges the gap from the first to the last, and it, it does it really well. Yeah. Especially like the last 20 minutes is all setting each character into their different paths. Some some cross at the end as well. And um, yeah, Two Towers, great film. Mm, yeah. So that is our review of the Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. So, you know. Join us next time when we tackle our fi the final part, the ending of a great motion pitch trilogy in The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, rate, comment, subscribe and all that good stuff. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. Thank you.